This is David Kurtz for TPM Media. We're here with Newsweek's Howard Feynman. Howard, what did you make of the uh, criticisms last night, the sort of mocking tone that the Republicans took towards Obama's community organizing background? Well, it doesn't surprise me because there's a big cultural divide. Most of the people in that convention had no idea what community organizers were. They're not going to know anything about the kind of work that uh, Barack Obama did on the south side of Chicago. And even if they knew about it, they wouldn't necessarily value it. Um, and I think more generally, people in that hall, being pretty conservative by nature, uh, don't think a whole lot of community organizing designed to pressure the government for an expansion of programs or expanded government help for people. These people in here like to think of themselves as uh, hardy independents who don't need the help of government. They just want government off their back. Of course, we know in reality they get Social Security, they get Medicare when they're older generally, uh, they want government subsidies for their businesses, you name it, but their ideology is such that, you know, they don't want any help. And that's why they were glad to be mocking the ideal that Obama is setting forth. You mentioned the cultural gap. I mean, that, it, it harkens back to the playbook, the liberal elitist playbook the Republicans have drawn from again and again. Is that going to be as effective this year? Well, we're about to find out because uh, as Rick Davis, the uh, CEO of the campaign and the guy running this convention says, uh, he said to the Washington Post the other day, this campaign, this convention is not about idea and not about issues. It's about character, essentially, and you can throw culture in there as well. And they're going to run a character and culture and patriotism campaign attempting to ignore the economy and the war in Iraq, except for defending the surge. And... Um, and we'll see if it works. It's worked several times for the Republicans. Uh, you would think at a time when the Republican president has an approval rating in the low 30s and the right direction wrong track number is about four to five out of five wrong track that it wouldn't work. But you know, this is America. We'll see. Palin's speech last night was very well received. I think the next question now is how much access she's going to have to the press. You just came off a hardball. Pat Buchanan was suggesting that they ought to keep her hidden for a while. Uh, do you think that's advisable? I actually think not. I think they're overmanaging. Uh, I, I saw her last night, and I know people in Alaska. I know Alaska a little bit, although I don't know her. I think she's pretty capable of handling herself. You don't want to immediately throw her you know, into the White House press room or... Uh, you know, line her up for Meet the Press and Face the Nation and George Stephanopoulos all in one weekend. But I think they should make her available and pretty quickly to, to, to the press corps because I think she can handle it and I think the longer they keep her bottled up, the more pressure there will be to do it. And I think she's perfectly capable of handling herself. That's my impression. I, I just think as a matter of politics, leave aside the, you know, journalistic morals of it. That they should do that. And as far as journalistic morals are concerned, we're past the day when any politician feels any moral responsibility to speak to the press. They, they feel they can communicate directly with the public in their own way, uh, in their own time, and they want to cut the so-called mainstream media out of it. And uh, they're both trying very hard to do it. Not just McCain. Obama's doing the same thing. Cutting the mainstream media out and this week here at the convention launching a really aggressive attack on the mainstream media, media generally, media so broad as to include tabloids and whatnot and sort of conflating yeah. uh, journalism and, and tabloid journalism. And, and you've been getting that pushback personally, too, from the campaign. Yeah, a little bit. I think what, the, I think what they want to do is run against the, quote, mainstream media, even though there is no such thing as a unified, monolithic mainstream media. They want to run against the media with a capital M because it fits into their cultural campaign. Because most the networks and the big newspapers and magazines are based in New York City, let's not forget. Uh, the entertainment industry is in Hollywood. Those are two very democratic blue areas. And so for this crowd, they're saying, look, our enemies are uh, on the other side of a culture war, and they include the media. So the media, for the most part, is, uh, are, is listed among the enemies inside that hall. Uh, I'm, I think it's unfortunate. I don't think it's justified. I think it's unfair. Uh, but, you know, occasionally we give them just enough rope that they can try to hang us with. So we have to be careful. In this case, what, what have you gotten pushed back from them on specifically? Well, uh, out of the blue, as far as I'm concerned, uh, they accused me of going around town predicting last Monday or Sunday and Monday that Sarah Palin would have to get out of the race. 
because uh, there would be revelations or she couldn't bear the scrutiny. I never said any such thing. As, uh, it was a complete lie on their part. I never said any such thing. As a matter of fact, in what I read, what I wrote for the web and what I said on the air, I was quite complimentary of her because I know people in Alaska who know her. I said no such thing. They heard rumors about it without checking it at all. Uh, a major uh, person in the campaign came out and accused me of that in, in the paper. It was, it was just wrong. And, and, and so intended far, to intimidate, you think? I, don't, I think so, sure. I don't know why else they would have done it without checking with me first, without seeing whether it was true, which it was not. Uh, and they had no proof whatsoever, and they've yet to apologize for it. So I think it was just a shot across the bow. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't make me mad. I'm still going to call all those people, including that same person who said it, because it's my job to cover the campaign, to try to cover it accurately and honestly. That's what I've done for 30 years, and that's what I'm going to continue to do. We can't, as reporters, we can't take the bait. Uh, we can't allow ourselves to be used as uh, cultural symbols in the campaign. We just have to ignore it and go and do our jobs day by day. My sense from the first couple of days here in uh, St. Paul was that there was some apprehension among Republicans about Palin and how this would all play out. And in the last 24 hours, especially after the speech last night, they seem really energized by her speech and optimistic. I mean, adding it all up, what's the, what's the outcome of this week for her and, and good or bad for the ticket? I think, it's, uh, I think on balance it's good for the ticket uh, because she will energize, not only energize the base, which, which was unenthusiastic, she'll energize it. But the energy she supplies will spread like through the tentacles of the Republican Party grassroots, will help their turnout, will help them defend the perimeter of the red states they already won. I don't think she helps them win states that they didn't win in 2004, but she helps them protect states that they did. Colorado, Virginia, yeah. states like that? Yeah, well, uh, Virginia, yes, I think. Colorado's tough. Uh, but maybe even here. Don't forget, there's a lot of drillers and hunters in Colorado. Colorado's just not all Boulder and Denver. So I, I think she helps them, maybe even in Iowa, uh, for the same reasons. Uh, New Hampshire, for the same reason. So uh, I, I, think, I think it was exciting. I think it's the, it's the most exciting pick he could have done. If he had picked Romney or Palin, we would have all been falling asleep. Palenti. Or, excuse me, or Palenti, or Palenti, I meant. We would have been sort of falling asleep in our chairs. If he'd have picked Joe Lieberman or uh, Tom Ridge, there would have been tremendous division here. So of the available choices, naming those five, uh, he picked the best one. And, he, and it, she could have been a disaster. So far, she's been a tremendous success. Uh, was she too, a little too nasty some of the time? Yeah. But did the people in the hall love her? Absolutely. And they're all, they're all going to be excited when they go home to their states to work for the ticket. Thank you, Howard. Okay. This is David Kurtz with Howard Feynman in St. Paul.